What's up, everybody? Welcome to Drive Through Sports with Adam and Paul for March the 30th, 2020. Coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia, Brentwood, Tennessee, respectively. And uh, this is wrapping up our first week of podcasts. And uh, we're going to start everybody off. Brees, how are you doing, man? Oh, man. I, you know, I don't know what day it is, but I'm, I, it's been a good day. Well, I agree with you there. I woke up this morning and uh, I had to I had to look at my watch because I wasn't sure what day it was uh, of the week, and it's kind of gotten into that scenario where uh, you know every day feels like ground Groundhog Day because uh, you know it's kind of like the same thing over and over. And uh, we talked a little about 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 it last night on last night's episode how the, the CDC guidelines, the social distancing guidelines, have gotten extended to April thirtieth and. So uh, basically, we've lost the month of April um, in our lives, really. Um, So even though there may not be much to look forward to out there, we're going to bring everybody some entertainment and uh, give them something to talk about uh, around the breakfast table, at least those that are following us and listening uh, and replaying these episodes. So uh, the first thing we talk about is something that that I kind of heard off the wire today that uh, I was watching – one of the uh, sports talk shows and they were talking about the NBA and you know, if the NBA season comes back, how's it going, what's it going to look like? How many, are they going to play all the games? Cause they really only had like 20 games left in the season before the playoffs started. And um, one of the ideas that was floated out there is to bring all the teams to Las Vegas and have, the, have the teams in NBA controlled hotels in a controlled environment and then pl- play the, the remaining games at different sites in Vegas, almost like uh, the NBA summer league uh, that they do now. What do you, what are your impressions on that? Well, you know, I think the, uh, the, the Chinese basketball league, I think try to start that same scenario over there. And it's been kind of a tough situation for those guys. I mean, you, you put all these teams and then you, you play, lock them up in a hotel for 14 days, they said, uh, from what I understand, quarantine them. And then after 14 days, they can come out, do practices, meetings, and all that stuff. And then they can, you know, if they – I think it's maybe another 14 days, if they could pass that, then they would uh, be able to uh, start playing it. Like, I think they named four – Four courts, the MGM Grand, the Mandalay Bay, uh, T-Mobile Arena, and the Thomas and Max Center, UNLV. So, you know, it, it's it's not ideal, but if yeah. you love the game, you're gonna you're, you're gonna do what you can. Yeah, and I, I think it's just an uh, you know the powers that be are just trying to put some you know it, this is unprecedented, so they're trying to put something together to try and salvage uh, you know salvage the season. You know, Major League Baseball's got a whole other problem. You know, they were almost done with spring training when this all hit. And, um, you know, so they're trying to figure out what their next, what their next move is going to be. And nobody really knows, um, uh, anything. And, and you talked about something, um, before, uh, we went on the air here, um, about the NCAA ruling that just came down on, uh, spring sport eligibility of that getting, uh, extended. So for those seniors who had their seasons basically taken away, uh, the NCAA is ruled. Uh, that they'll be given an extra year of eligibility. That's kind of a big deal. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think it plays a really uh, a bigger deal in college baseball. As you know, the, 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 the rule is, you know, you can declare what after a freshman year. And then if you, if you don't declare for the draft, then you have to wait till after your junior year. I think right. that's how NCAA works. So, you know, that puts a kink into like, you know, what are you classifying as – can you, you know, who can go and be eligible for the draft right away? But the other sports in uh, in college, I mean, you know, from golf to, you know, lacrosse, track and field, or, yeah, track and tennis, field, softball, all those, yeah, you know, those yeah. those those athletes definitely have a chance to, uh, you know, continue, you know, to try to, you know, their college athletic career. Well, another thing too that that I think gets lost in this whole thing is that extra year of eligibility. You got to look at the high school seniors that are being recruited to come in as freshmen. Now, all of a sudden, you know, you might have thought that you know you were getting a spot was there for you because they were losing somebody, 
Now that person's coming back for an additional year, an additional season. So those upcoming freshmen, their playing time is going to be impacted uh, in a way that they didn't see coming, uh, you know, when they maybe signed their original, original letter of intent, whether it was an early signing or in February. Yeah, I think absolutely you're, you're correct. And, you know, when you're, you're recruited, uh, you know, playing time is always probably 80% of the whole thing and 20% it has to do with the school and the location and, and probably what your parents have to say, you know. Uh, yeah. But, you know, you want to go in as a freshman thinking that, hey, I want to take the field or the court, you know. Or I've got, you know, I've got an even chance. I've got a chance by proving right. there's a spot available. And if that spot's not even there and you've got a two-year starter that's playing shortstop and you're a shortstop that got recruited to replace him, um, you know, that puts that opens up a whole other can of worms uh, for those incoming athletes. And, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, the NBA, we talk about um, Major League Baseball, college sports. And all these things have one thing in common. They all need officials and umpires. And you and I know a little bit about umpiring from our days back <laughs> in the day. And, you know, we both, we both did some umpiring. I did, you know, I started doing uh, freaking T-ball, you know, which was horrible. And then it, you know, moved up to, I was doing a lot of 11, 12, 13 year old games. Um, uh, you know, then we got an opportunity presented to us, which we thought at the time was the easiest gig out there we were both in college I think I was a freshman and uh it was our my freshman my freshman summer and your sophomore summer and you just lived right down the street from the park uh over there behind Brentwood Middle School and um our good buddy Ben Tyree and it was our church Concord Road Church of Christ played in that that church league and he's like he's like hey you guys he approaches the church one day he's like hey you guys want to we we'll make some money. I know you guys are umpires. You want to umpire some games for us in our in our league. So it was kind of a no brainer for us. I mean, what were I don't even remember what we got paid, but it was more than nothing. I think it was yeah. maybe twenty bucks a game, maybe. I mean, that, obviously, when you're in college, any cash money is tremendous. Yeah. Oh, it was, it was <clears throat> huge. There was no uh, no ten forties or nothing like that. You, no, you, you know, you, and going back, Adam, I got to tell you this. I think you know Ben Tyree. Uh, who we've played a lot of softball with, who's currently the uh, Trevecca University women's softball coach. Uh, he, you know, I think he said, he, guys, you want to make some money here? You can be the umpires because you're not good enough to play on my softball team. <laughs> I th- think that was the uh, the cover between you and me that uh, we were going to make the cut to play on the church softball team. Well, let's be honest. Our, our church softball team, I think they were what? Three guys that went to our church that played on that men's team, <laughs> the elite squad of freaking bashers. Now, you and I played we, – we did go to the state tournament with that team, and that was a lot of fun. But you're talking the, the McMurtry brothers and all their uh-huh. – We had Mark Baird. We had uh, – Mark Baird, uh, yeah. Uh, Joseph, uh, whose two sons play uh, pro ball right now, one with the Cubs, one with the Blue Jays. Yeah, and Mark lineup. Joseph. Mark Joseph. Mark but, Joseph. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Brentwood legend Phil Hardeman. Phil Hardeman was on that team. Yeah, that was a great. That was a nice little Knoxville road trip. But yeah, we weren't gonna. We weren't gonna. Um, once that team evolved, I think the writing was on the wall that we were not going to be making any more road trips with that team. And um, the closest we were going to get to them was officiating them. So that's, <laughs> that sort of. That sort of that sort of put the, <laughs> puts into perspective sort of where we were on the uh, on the totem pole of uh, you know uh, if they were if they were the major leagues we were in like rookie ball uh, at that point <laughs> because they had stocked the lineup with a bunch of heavy hitters and of course with with Ben pitching uh, he was the, he was a Cy Young award winner every year um, and just he could absolutely just drop it in there. Uh, like nobody I've ever seen pitch a softball, and he was amazing. and And I think he batted like eight fifty. You know, I yeah, mean, yeah, he was he was on base literally every. <clears throat> but that that league, I think it was about eight eight teams, and I think they were all church teams from the local area. Well, supposed, <laughs> right? But Listen, you guys got to understand that when uh, me and Freeman played church ball, 
you know, the T-shirt is what we got. By the time the, <laughs> the, the team started evolving and we, we started winning and then all of a sudden uh, we were squeezing in a few more players, we had like three different uniforms. <laughs> okay? Yeah. And, and including some sponsors, I think, as well. So, uh, but yes, the, 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 I think it was eight or 12 different, you know, churches that were participating in this league. Yeah, so and, and I can't remember what night of the week. I think it was maybe a Tuesday night league that they'll play on. And so they would typically have um three games a night. And as I recall, the rule was that you cannot start an inning after an hour and fifteen minutes. Am I correct? Yeah, I I believe that's that was correct. I'm I, there was a time definitely that was given to us right okay so it was a time limit game now if you started the the top of the six it was six inning games if you started the top of the sixth at one, an hour and 14 in you finished the inning okay which, so if which would normally take 20 minutes maybe yeah so if you're the home team and you're behind as long as that inning got started you had the at bat, okay. You still had the final at bat, so that's kind of just to give you guys some background on how the game was set up. Now, in in walk me and Brees, okay, and we're at the tail end of a three game back to back to back, and it just so happened that um, we Concord Road had already played. Um, I think they played the game before us. And it was it was either Brentwood Methodist, Brentwood Baptist, or two of those um, two of those teams. So, it, kind of paint the picture of what you recall. I think you were behind the plate in that game, and yeah, because that meant you were in charge because we rotated. <laughs> yeah, which turned out to be the the powder keg that started the whole thing. So I, I was in the field. So. So paint them. The, yeah. So, oh, so, so exactly I, I, went down. Yeah. I, you know, I don't listen. We're going to have to both fill each other in on the uh, particulars. Uh, you know, it, was, it wasn't just yesterday, but it is something that is stuck in our memory bank that has uh, entertained us for years and years and stories that we talk about. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you the specifics. I do remember when I was behind the plate and we had up our, you know, we had, we had started, got our feet wet and started to settle in with, you know, games. And we were starting to understand, listen, we could shut this game off. We could find ways to end the game and get paid. I mean, because obviously our job was to get back to college and, you know, and figure out what was going on in the dorms or find what, you know, what was going on. This was not our priority. No, priorities were – This was were, a job. Yeah. We, we didn't have any real, like, investment in what happened – this was punch the clock. Let's get the games. Let's yeah, move on. Yeah. Let's move on. I just remember it was the sixth inning, and the guy that was pitching, <laughs> I, I, he was not. Uh, they they weren't happy with my calls uh, behind the plate. I, I I can I can vaguely remember that, and I think I maybe Ray run this guy up right or. Well, th what I remember is they were ahead. The team in the field. The team in the field was ahead. That's right. And, or excuse me, the team in the field, but, no, no. They, they were losing. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. But, they were the, but they were the home team. Home team. So, you were, this guy's like throwing warm-up pitch after warm-up pitch, and you're like, you're like, let's play. And he kept. They, That's right. They now kept throwing the ball around the infield, throwing the ball around the infield, and you're like they were, they were, they were. If I'm not now, now that it's coming back, they were stalling to try to end the game. Right? Is that right? They're they're stalling, trying trying to end the game. Yeah, and so <laughs> finally, after throwing the ball around the infield and not, and the other team is pissed because they know the time. I mean, they know the time rule as well. And so they're they're yelling at you, going, 
tell him to start, tell him to throw. We need to play ball. Let's go. <laughs> so you're getting crap from them. I'm just out in the field, just observing all this, trying to get the pitcher to freaking throw a pitch so we can officially start the inning because you can't start the inning until a pitch is thrown. And I think it wasn't so much the guys in the field that ticked you off. It was the other team right. that was freaking getting on you so bad. And I, <laughs> I don't know what – I know what happened because I was there, but I think you just – I think you just – you were done, and you were like, "Yeah, I can, I, it's within my power to call this game, or I can stand out here for another 20 minutes and let these freaking idiot 35-year-olds <laughs> – I get paid 20 bucks either way. So, they kept rat, just ribbing you and ribbing you, going, let's play, let's play, let's play. So, so you looked at your watch, and you were like, ball game. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> and when that and when that happened, it was like it was like the George Brett Pintar incident. I mean, the bench cleared, they're going they're like going you're you're walking out through the other dugout. I'm following you. That whole freaking team, there's like fifteen dudes are like following us out to our cars in the parking lot. And I've never been so glad and well here's the thing too, like in my mind, I'm like, all I got to do is get to my car because I got a freaking bat in the back. I got a softball bat in the back of my car. I said, I'm going for my softball bat. And you were across the parking lot. Half of them were following you. Half of them were following me. And I was almost to my car, and I got my key in my my hatch. And I was, I was getting it out, and I was reaching for my bat. And I've never been so glad to see Ben Tyree <laughs> entire life. Because he pulls in in his Maxima, and uh, I see that white Maxima, and I'm like, oh, thank goodness. Because he was commissioner of the league. Yeah. And he pulls up, and he's like, he's like, fellas, fellas, what's, what's going on? What's going on? <laughs> and they're like, they're, they're trying to cheat us. They stopped the game, blah, blah. And he's like, what time is it? How long have you been playing? They're like, well, well, it was right at the 115, and, and he, and he, I think he said something to you like, Paul, was it – had did you start the innings? Like, nope, didn't start the inning. Went 115. That's ball game. And so we just got, and we basically left Ben there to deal with these 15 dudes who were irate because they had just lost a softball game. <laughs> I mean, these are guys like 40 years old and two teenage kids. Yeah, we're, we're, we're dictating whether they yeah, won or lost. Right. We're dictating whether they won or lost. And it's basically that we just like, um, you know, destroyed their sandcastle or something. That's what yeah. Yeah, we kicked it over. We kicked yeah. it over. We, we, uh, we, we took we all their kicked... alcoholic beverages and poured them down the drain. <laughs> yeah. We, we basically ruined all their fun that night. And, uh, they, uh, they kind of, you know, from that point forward, whenever we did a game, uh, it, there was a little bit of tension with that particular team. And I do, I do recall that whenever we umpired that team, Ben had to be there. Like we stipulate, okay, Ben, we got you know Brentwood Baptist where you got to be there for this one. You, you, you know you can't leave because these yeah. guys are freaking crazy. Uh, but yeah, that's just you know something as as teenagers when you're putting a, an authority position over adults, especially when they're playing a sport. Good grief, man! The dang, you know the gloves come off, man. They were they were ready to freaking beat us down in the parking lot. Yeah, and I, I you know I tried to gaze over to you before I was going to call a ball game. And you weren't paying attention to me at all. So I just said, man, I hope you're following me because we got to get out of here. And when I said ball game, and I heard enough. And I was like, let's go, Bird. <laughs> we were and, hightailing it to the cars for sure. But, yeah, I do remember the next time we had him, man, I was like, all right, Freeman, you're behind the plate. Yeah, exactly. Tossing me behind the plate that time. Jeez almighty. You know, and I, and I – you know, I don't know – I, I may have told you this or not, but uh, I, my my officiating career still continues to this day. I know. Um, I actually went to see you up at the sportsplex. Up that's there. right. That's basketball. right. You know, there's one thing about AAU basketball that just dumbfounds me is that every time there's a breakaway layup, you can guarantee three or four people in the crowd are going to yell out, Ed won! <laughs> whether they're challenged on the shot or there's nobody even guarding them. 
Uh, or how about the, the, my, my favorite one that my favorite quote that's thrown from the stands is that's over the back. <laughs> <laughs> well, if the kid jumps higher than your kid and reaches over your kid and grabs the ball away before your kid's puny vertical <laughs> can get to the ball, it's not a foul. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Th just th those, uh, you know, some, some umpiring, umpiring stories. Those are, that's one of the, that's one of the top ones that I can remember. I don't ever remember ever being followed out to my car in the parking lot after a game, except for that. And, you know, cars were a big part of, uh, of us growing up. And, um, one of the, <laughs> you guys, you guys on the podcast hear us talk about different guys and throw out different names and, and stuff like that. And, and, uh, one of the guys that we ran with back in the day, um, Pete McKnight, Pete McKnight <laughs> was a character now and, uh, wore a trench coat everywhere. And, um, I can remember, I can remember Pete got a Nissan 200 SX and he was insistent. He's like, we're going out. He's like, I'm driving. Well, Brees, if you remember, it had snowed like four inches. And we were kind of, we think, you know, we think we had, we didn't know anything about cabin fever until we have, you know, cabin fever like we have right now. But we had been inside for like two days. Couldn't get out, whatever. So, Pete. Well, we, all, we always made it to church. Always. Always. And it, is, it still is amazing that our parents would let us go out with a 16 year old and pile into a car in the snow and say, yeah, we'll see you later. <laughs> Be back at 10. Yeah. Where yeah. There is no way we would let our kids get anywhere near a car no. driving in the snow at all. Absolutely and I think not. that is just the lessons that we were <laughs> instilled upon in, in life lessons that we did our own self has created this, Oh, oh yeah, I remember hyper hyper vigilance as parents by perfectly uh, all the things that can go wrong. So let's let me paint the picture here. So we've been we've been inside for two days. So we start getting these phone calls, and so it's Pete McKnight, and so he calls Paul. Paul calls me, and I call. I think maybe Lee Tomberlin or something. And so it's and maybe Craig Cottrell too. And we call, and it's it's five of us. Okay. So McKnight comes and gets us, and he lives in like Mount Juliet or somewhere. I mean, he lives well far from. Uh, I tell you what, the, somehow the guy ended up living in some places that <laughs> were either haunted or famous <laughs> or something. The, yeah. How this guy? The guy lived in the Moreland Estates. Uh, oh yeah, there, that's. Uh, but that's a whole nother story. That's a whole other story for but, sure. Yeah, uh, he, he 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 traveled far and wide. I know he yeah. had uh, quite a quite a bit to get to us but anyway he so he comes and picks everybody up now again there's still four or five inches of snow on the ground roads aren't great so what do I do I've got to convince my parents that it's safe for me to go out <laughs> so we start I start laying it down I was like man I was like I was like mom come on I mean, we've been cooped up in this house for two days you know the roads aren't that bad blah blah, blah. I said like, Pete's got a brand he's got a new car it's got great tires on it blah blah all this stuff so it's me, you, Lee, and Craig, and Pete driving. So I was like, Mom, we're just going to go to McDonald's and get something to eat just to hang out, and we'll be back in like an hour, hour and a half. So that was my story. And, and they bought it. And, and, and that's exactly what we did, though. But it was the point A to B back to A where the real story lies here. And... <laughs> So we all leave from my house. I was the last one to get picked up. So instead of being smart and taking the interstate to Highway 96, where the McDonald's was, the nearest McDonald's was in Franklin. You, you remember this? Absolutely. Went there first. And so we, we decided to go the back way. And at the time, you know, there was no Cool Springs Mall. There was no McEwen, you know, Parkway, all that stuff back there. Those hotels back there, none of that. If you go down Moore's Lane, you could turn right. If you were headed towards Granny White, you could turn right, and there was a, just a little, almost like a one-lane paved road, and it led to like a gravel road, and you turned right on it, and then it dead-ended into, um, into a stop sign, and there was an access road that you would take a left, you could take it all the way, you know, it wound around a little bit, 
but you could take it all the way to Franklin. And so instead of instead of going the traditional way, yeah, hey, yeah, let's not let's not take let's not take the easy way where the streets may be cleared, right? Let's take the side roads exactly. that are packed yeah. with snow. Yeah, and nobody has traveled on these roads. They're completely covered in ice and snow. So we take a right onto this one-lane road, and we get down there, and then we get down to the point where we turn right on the gravel road. So the whole time, since this is a new, a new, relatively new car, it's a new car to Pete. It's not a brand-new 200SX. So we get him, and we're like, Pete, come on, come on, punch it, punch it, punch it. And so he's like, shut up. No, it's brand new, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Freaking out. He doesn't do it. So we get him. He doesn't know the road. We know the road, but he doesn't. And he's driving. <laughs> so the gravel road is perpendicular to the interstate. And there is a stop sign there. Well, he's going like 60 miles an hour, okay? And he doesn't know there's a stop sign there. We all assume he does, but he's living in like Mount Juliet. He's never driven this road. He blows through the stop sign, goes over the access road, and we end up between the access road and the interstate in four inches of snow. And he is absolutely freaking out. He's like, I wrecked my car, you guys are crazy. And so we think that's hilarious, right? We're like, oh my gosh, you know. So somehow we get back on the road. So he's completely freaking out. He's going like 20 miles an hour. We finally get to McDonald's and he's still mad at us. And uh, so we eat and we come back. So instead of, again, instead of taking the safe route home, we go back the same way we came. All right. And there's this huge hill that we had trouble getting up. Okay. So we're like, Pete, Pete, come on, punch it going down this hill. He's like, no, no. And, and I think Lee was in the front seat. <laughs> At one point, Lee may have grabbed his leg and pushed him on the accelerator, I think. So we're flying down this, down this hill. Well, what Pete didn't realize and what none of us realized is that there's like a 90 degree curve <laughs> hill and it just goes right into this pasture and it go, breaks right through. He goes, we go straight off the road into this wire fence that had barbed wire across the top and it just raked across the top of Pete's <laughs> brand new car. And when we finally came to a stop, I looked out the window and there's a freaking cow staring at me like, what are you doing in my field? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. uh, Man. And and I think at some point in that same night, we may have headed to, there may have been a trip to Brentwood Country Club on that. Uh, Absolutely. But uh, But anyway, uh, anyway, you know, poor Pete. I mean, you know, (laughs) obviously every time you've got a new car, you want to be the guy that Uh, says, let's go. Let's do Fortunately it. Fortunately for Pete, it was in a place he didn't know. It had <laughs> snow all over the place. And, hey, he was within six inches of hitting a cow. So there you oh, go. And, and the, the fact that we were able to hit the fence between the fence posts almost Post. exactly and just slide to a stop in the middle of that field, it just, uh, you know, of course, we thought it was hilarious. He was very, very upset. Well, that gets us to the end of this episode. And we hope you guys share it on your social media. We'll have it posted on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeart, and Spotify. So, and, and YouTube, YouTube, YouTube channel. Check out our new YouTube Man. Drive Through Sports with Adam and Paul. So, for Paul Brees in Brentwood, Tennessee, this is Adam Freeman coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia. You've been listening to Drive Through Sports with Adam and Paul.